Hey everybody, this is Carlos. Thanks for joining us. On today's show, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Warren Booth of Boa Booth. Dr. Booth is a great boa breeder focusing on Central American boas, and he's also an associate professor of biological science at Tulsa University. We're going to talk about how he got involved in the boa game and his plans for the upcoming season. We will also talk about his work with parthenogenesis and his love of Central American boa morphs. Finally, we're going to talk about the importance of having genetic diversity in your collection. Boa Rack Radio is on the air now. Welcome everybody to Boa Rack Radio. I'm your host, Carlos Rojas of Morse Unleashed. Today our guest is Dr. Warren Booth. Dr. Booth is based out of the University of Tulsa and is known for his work with parthenogenesis and population genetics. He is widely considered one of the best breeders of Central American morphs, including the Costa Rican T-positive. Warren, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot, Carlos. It's good to be here. So, Warren, um, I know you've given this in a previous show, but for the folks that might be uh, unfamiliar with you and with your work, give us a little bit of background how you got involved with BOAs and how you got involved uh, with, with reptiles in general. Yeah, so um, with reptiles in general, it's kind of an odd story. I was, you know, I, I'm from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I was working for my dad. Uh, he was a firefighter, but he also had a, a business where he repaired and cleaned and installed fires and boilers, and I would help him in the summer and at the weekends. And I was maybe 16 years old, 17 years old, and I was helping him. And in one of these houses we were working in, beside the fireplace, there was a uh, maybe like a three-foot enclosure that had, it was probably a garter snake, but it was just moving around in this cage, and I was kind of mesmerized by it. And I went home, and I, I talked to my mom, and I was like, uh, any chance I could get a reptile? And she's like, sure, whatever you want. Uh, my, my parents were very open, because at one point in, in their lives, they'd owned a, a, a pet store. So we always had some kind of menagerie in the house. Um, so we went out and I got a, uh, I got a leopard gecko. And after about a year, maybe six months, um, I then got a hognose snake, a western hognose. And it kind of escalated from there. And about a, you know, I think I got a hognose and then a couple of California king snakes. And then I, uh, I got a trio of ball pythons. And then I got Amazon tree boas. And I still am amazed by Amazon tree boas and uh, maybe a year later I was the person that I got wild caught Amazon tree boas from was also a locality boa guy called Clive Osborne in the UK okay. and uh, you know this is a guy that had like Nebulosa and Arophius wow. and wild caught <laughs> hog islands and you know just a remarkable collection but he had told me he was able to get um, six Sonoran desert boas from Germany uh, and asked if I was interested in them, he told me the size of them, and, and because of their small size, I, I kind of jumped on the deal. Um, I ended up keeping a pair, and I, I sold the rest along with a friend. And um, I, I kept the largest pair, which were probably about four and a half feet long. And uh, How did those things adapt to captivity when you... Uh... Well, these were, these were captive bred, oh, I these believe. These guys were captive bred. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, it turns out they were probably all siblings. Um, but I... Yeah, I kind of neglected them. I, I kept them in a like a four foot enclosure on the bottom of a rack and didn't really pay much attention to it. And uh, I kept them together and fed them and generally just ignored them. And uh, at one point, I moved them into a larger enclosure. And, and one night I was working in my room. This was in 2002. And I turned around and the female was giving birth. Oh, wow. Totally, un totally unexpected to me. And uh, in that litter, there were... Um, she produced the first pure anarthristic sonorans. Um, oh. Yeah, so it was kind of amazing. So there was a stillborn and there was a live. I kept the live one, obviously. And uh, a year later, she produced four more. A year later, she produced six more. And, and because there was none of these about, and because of their small size, they really took off. And in the UK, I started trading them for albino cows and hypomelanistics, the salmon hypos, and and head blood bows and a few other bits and pieces that at that point in time were still pretty pretty expensive and I started building up this small kind of boa group in the meantime I still had about 50 Amazon tree boas and some emerald tree boas and uh, and I was just fascinated by these Sonoran desert boas um, then kind of fast forward to 2006 and I moved to the US after doing my PhD and I moved to the US to, to work on a postdoctoral position in North Carolina and I sold a lot of my animals, including all of my Amazon tree boas. And I exported uh, 28 boas from Belfast to, to the U.S. Oh, man, that, that must have been nerve-wracking. 
Uh, I can tell you a story, man. That was in December. Uh, I shipped them from Dublin, which is about 100 miles from Belfast. So I drove down early in the morning. I put them on a Delta flight, and they were arriving in New Jersey, or they were arriving in Philadelphia uh, oh, to a friend of mine, John and Jane Camp, who were both uh, kind of big into Amazon tree boas. And uh, they were collecting them for me and then going to house them for a, a couple of months until I got established in North Carolina and went up to collect them. So I assumed they were on the flight and everything was good. And later on that evening, I got a phone call in the middle of the night by John telling me that he was at the airport and nothing arrived. And he would wait for the next flight and nothing arrived. And he'd wait for the next flight and nothing arrived. And at this point, you know, it's, you can imagine what temperature it was in Philadelphia in yeah, December. Yeah. So I was sitting and thinking, right, here's a, a box that's got, you know, these anarthristic sonorans and these albino boas and everything else that I could think of. And I thought, well, that's going to be a write-off. That's done. Um, mm. Thankfully, the next morning, I got a phone call from my friend to say that uh, the person in Philadelphia that collected the box from the, from the plane put it in their office but forgot to scan it. Oh, so it was man. sitting in a warm room and everything was fine. So uh, That was a lucky break, yeah. man. Oof. Yeah, I could, you know, that heart attack that I had, it turned out, you know, I, I survived that one. And then in the U.S., I just started picking up other things. You know, it wasn't easy to get things like hypomelanistic sonorans in Belfast or leopard boas. So that's some of the first things that I got in the U.S. And, and, and really, my, my kind of passion for boas really took off. Um, and, you know, that, that extended. So I, like, primarily, I've been working with sonoran boas. But then I, I was offered the opportunity to get into the, the Costa Rican tea positive animals uh, maybe about 14 years ago or 13 years ago. And... And I've worked with those pretty quietly in the background for many years, building up double hats and triple hats. And it's only in the last couple of years that I've really started advertising what I've been producing. Um, and so I, I work primarily with Boa Imperator, the Costa Rican, the Nicaragua, and the Honduran, so like the Onyx Boas and stuff like that. I've got a bunch of those. Um, and then uh, I've got the Boa Sigma, which are the Sonoran Boas. And then other than that, it's just a bunch of tree Boas and some pythons and bits and pieces. Nice, man. So outside of reptiles, what are some of your other hobbies or other things that uh, catch your interest? You know, being a, you know, being a university professor, I'm really just, I love science. So I'm kind of immersed in what I do with science. But my hobbies that I was into a lot more before I became an academic and my time got absorbed and then had kids and stuff like that is uh, I've been playing bass guitar for maybe 30 something years huh. um, back in Northern Ireland, kind of semi-professionally and, and you know, I try to play sometimes at home uh, after I'm work I work a lot late in the evening, so it's not as easy, but you know, I've got that. And other than that, um, craft beer, I like brewing beer. Oh, really? Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, one of my buddies is actually, who uh, was actually on the show early on just started his craft brewing company not too long ago, man. And I, I was listening I to that I today. Yeah, man, I love being uh, I love being the guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never complained, and my friends have never complained. So yeah, yeah, uh, no, definitely, yeah. man. I like it. So let me ask you, what kind of made you go from a, a hobby collection into more of a breeding collection, where you had more dedicated focus with the work that you were doing within your own collection? You know, yeah, I, I still consider myself very much a hobbyist, um, even though I've got about 140 snakes. Um, I think it was just, you know, being a geneticist, kind of being fascinated by what you can produce, all these different crosses. So, you know, it was like, well, I don't have this, so maybe if I get that, I can make double heads of this and triple heads of that and build all these combinations. So I think that was part of it, um, just trying to keep some kind of focus. Like, I love the idea of having different animals, and I do have many different species, but I like the idea of having some kind of focus where um, I can say there's an organized group that I can work with. Um, and that was fine because at that point it was all Central American Boa Imperator. And then a couple of years ago I was involved in a study where we split Boa Imperator and, and we um, resurrected Boa Sigma. Right. So we, I, <laughs> I deliberately started making hybrids. Not in well, not deliberately. Um, I was making hybrids because crossing Costa Ricans into Sonorans and Nicaraguans and stuff like that. Uh, so I think I've always liked the small sized boas. You know, I... I've never, I very quickly sold the Carl albinos and the Salmon hypos and stuff like that, um, just purely due to size. You know, I like the idea that, you know, some of the animals that I've got, like the uh, West Snake K and the 
Crawl K and the Lagoon Key Boas, they're, you know, you can keep them in a CB70. Right. And for some of them, it's more than spacious. Um, the other ones I keep in FB90s and, and again, more than enough room for them. So I, I kind of like the small size. Um, no, definitely, yeah. man. So um, when you were getting started uh, back in the UK, was there anybody that kind of mentored you uh, into, into the whole reptile hobby or... Did you receive any mentoring, maybe from any uh, any breeders in the states? Who were the people that you looked up to as you were starting to take this a little bit more seriously? Yeah, that's a good question. I was trying to think about that today. You know, back in in Northern Ireland, reptiles were not a big thing. There was a dedicated reptile store called City Reptiles, and uh, the owner Victor Carruthers was very um, knowledgeable, and he would share any information he could with you. Um, and there was a couple of other people in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, my buddy Jonathan Harvey and, and Tony Wilson were people that we would get together and talk snakes with. Um, I had to go over to England to this guy Clive, Clive Osborne's place and see some cool things. But I don't think there was any real mentoring to say, this is how you breed, this is what you do. You know, as I said, when I bred Sonoma, the first time it was totally accidental. Right. Uh, but coming with, at it with a science background, um, you know, I started reading a lot of scientific papers and I picked up books like the, you know, the Ross and Marzac, the reproductive uh, biology of pythons and boas. And I right. started reading, kind of immersing myself in those. Uh, and I think it was through that more um, than than anybody turning around and saying you should do this and try that. You know, a lot of it was was just hit and miss. You know, I I built up a very big collection of wild caught emerald tree boas and Amazon tree boas, and and it was a lot early on was a lot of kind of hit and miss to get humidity right and temperatures right and so on. But with boas, I don't think boas are that hard to breed. I don't do anything with mine. I can tell you that later on. I don't cycle them. Not uh, I don't deliberately cycle them. I just let the room cycle. Um, I food cycle them. I neglect them in terms of what I feed them. You know, I feed my adult boas maybe eight or nine times a year. Um, but this is all just based on kind of what I read in the scientific literature and what we know about what these animals do in the wild. So there was nobody really that, that mentored me, but I looked up to people like Peter Cowell for what he did. And whenever I got the opportunity to meet Pete, uh, when I moved to the U.S. Uh, 14 or 15 years ago, and I was just I saw his collection, and I was just blown away by it. You know, the IMG boas that he had and the... You know, the leopards that he had, everything was huge. That's the one thing I remember about Pete's place. Every animal was absolutely enormous. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, I've got some good friends like Dave and Tracy Barker and um, uh, Rich Eiley, uh, people like that. You know, I, I look up to them and I still, you know, anytime I get to sit down with them and chat with them, we're always talking, you know, about, about boas and pythons and snakes in general. So, I, you know, being a scientist, I, I tell people that you never stop learning and you should never stop learning. So I'll... I'll talk to anybody about reptiles, and I'll try and learn from them. Uh, Absolutely. So I think there's, there's yeah. a lot of people that would act as, you know, it's not necessarily a mentor, but people that you can share information with and, and garner information from. No, that's fantastic, man. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit about your primary focuses. Obviously, I know you work with Central American boas and obviously with Corallis. Um, let's talk about the Central Americans a little bit further. What kind of, and you briefly touched on this, what kind of drew you to these boas? And... Um, What's your take on their personality? Uh, because I know uh, maybe one of the knocks that people who are unfamiliar with them may feel like they're a little bit more aggressive than maybe some of the some of their southern cousins. Yeah, the thing that drew them drew me to them was size. Uh, I loved I loved boas. My my friend Jonathan Harvey had this big Colombian boa, but it was huge, and I didn't want that. But I liked the body plan. I liked the color. And whenever I was given the opportunity to get these Sonoran boas that get to four and a half or five and a half feet, I jumped on the choice uh, at the chance of that. Um, personality wise, I've never had any that are really that bad. I've got one. Sorry, I do have one that will, will kill you um, <laughs> or try to kill you. Um, and it's a really neat snake. So otherwise, I would have given this away a long time ago. Uh, it's what I'm trying to prove out. But uh, I don't find their personality bad at all. I, it's funny because I do sell some boas to people. And uh, they'll tell me, you know, I'll tell them, yes, it's, it's pretty placid. You know, I don't handle these animals a lot, but whenever I take it out to clean and stuff, I don't get bitten, they don't hiss. Right. And then, then it arrives with a new person and they, they've got some kind of Satan snake on their hands. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, with mine, it's, uh, I've never really had a problem with it. So, therefore, the small size, the, the color morphs that they come in and the pattern morphs that are really there and still yet to be explore, explored in a lot of real detail and in a bigger way, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and their size is just fantastic. You know, adult males that I've got are three feet long and eat adult mice, you know, or small rats once a month. You know, I, I think it's hard to beat. You know, you got a, 
a boa constrictor that's, that's the size of a corn snake. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And then one thing that you did mention that uh, I think is important because I feel like not enough people do this is uh, cycling the feed, right? Yeah. So yeah. I personally have done it. I, I took the same approach as you. I based most of the way that I care for my animals based on scientific papers versus pure hobbyist uh, information that you'll find in the Internet, right? And, mm -hmm. for example, like my boas go on a three-month fast every year. Right? Yeah, mine, mine are the same. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like that usually gets me – healthier animals who are more productive and more active just in general, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about some projects that have you excited within uh, the Central American boas that you're currently working with. Uh, right now, uh, the things that I'm really excited about with the Sonorans are you know, pretty the, the key morphs, so you know the leopard, which I think still has a huge amount of potential. Uh, the oh, absolutely. People have only really mixed it into what, blood yeah. a little bit and maybe yeah. some of the albinism some albi genes. Exactly, yeah. that's it. Um, and the Sonoran hypomelanistics, the pure hypomelanistics from Sonora, I think are really cool. And then the anarthristic Sonorans are just mind-blowing, in my opinion. They're, if you think about the black-eyed anarthristic boas, the, mm -hmm. they're jet black, they're gray, and they're white. There's no brown color. That's what the Sonoran boas are like. They just don't have the jet black eyes. They've got silver eyes or gray eyes. So, and, and their locality pure, they're a Sonoran boa. Um, so having those and, and having combinations of them all and... and double heads and triple heads of them. Um, that's something that's very exciting. I get a lot of emails every year about anarthristic Sonorans, and I'm, I'm stupid because I kind of neglected that project over the years um, to the point where I didn't produce them for many years. And now the ones that I do produce, I just hold back, and I just brought some in from uh, Europe as well from a friend just to build up my group. Um, so hopefully in the next year I'm going to be producing like uh, ghost and super ghost pure oh, wow. sonorans that, that, that'll be fantastic yeah the pure um pure anarthristic leopards um th that kind of thing you know so i'm excited about that um the costa ricans really take up most of my time because i, I that started with with one t positive costa rican and then i was given the opportunity to get another pair um and i think that was the entire group that was available at the time I don't know anybody else with the pure Costa Ricans other than the ones that I've sold. And when I got them, it was two males and a female, uh, very quickly I started breeding those males to other animals. So I bred it into black-eyed anarthristics and leopard and orange tail hypos, uh, Inca, uh, blood, and I'm trying to think what else I got bred into, a bunch of different things. And I would hold back the double hats or the triple hats, so it means that I got a lot of those animals. And it's only in the last couple of years that I've started putting those back to each other to produce right. the combination. So uh, last year I paired um, orange tail hypo double head Costa Rican T positive leopard with a double head Costa Rican T positive leopard. And uh, I produced the orange tail hypo leopard Costa Rican T positive. And wow. it was a male. It's, wow. it's the only one in the world and it's a male and it's just mind blowing. Um, that year I also produced the only. Um, Costa Rican T positive Central American Motleys. Um, so they're cool. I produced 2.1 of those. Um, and I've got uh, probably next year I'll, I'll be producing, uh, hopefully, pairing a bunch of black and anarthristic Costa Rican T double hats. So there's a lot of those kind of projects that I'm really happy with, really excited about. And then the Inca, I've got Inca hat Costa Rican teas that I'm pairing uh, this year that I hope to produce something from. So they're yeah, exciting. Yeah, I think the Inca is going to mix lovely. With, yeah, with the T plus, I think yeah, just the, the thickness of the saddles that's which is going to be fantastic. And the variation in the color of the oh, Costa Rican yeah. teas, you know, they go from very purple to being kind of cream and pink in color. And I think the variety is going to be really neat with those. And then adding hypomelanism to that, I think it's going to be pretty cool. And then other animals that I'm raising up, um, I've got a small group of, of the Onyx and Super Onyx boas. So I've got um, a Sumatan, which is the Central American, Mo well, the Honduran Motley. Uh, onyx which is I know it's going to be a pain people are not going to be happy with me saying it but it's kind of the leopard equivalent in Honduras yeah, fair enough um, yeah. there's people that will disagree with that uh, we'll see next year but um, it's the het it would be the het version so it's the, the onyx and the central Amer or the Honduran motley and they're also het for Honduran T positive and then I've got a super onyx which is het for Honduran T positive I've got a ghost super onyx that's possible double head blood and T positive and then I've got an anarthristic onyx which is possible double head for blood and T positive so they're a cool little group that I'm raising up uh, 
I'm working with hog islands again, which I didn't do for a long time. And I got a gravid female at the moment. I'm trying to think what else. Um, as far as the boa imperator and boa sigma, that's kind of the main ones that I'm playing with now. I think I think I've, I've, I, I work with um, berry bloods as well. So I've got okay. I got a gravid double head berry blood nick T positive right now. Um, I'm trying to go slow with the boas this year. I don't want to breed too many. Over the last years, I've been I've been saying that, and I've ended up with six or seven or eight litters. This year, I'm deliberately going for like maybe three boa litters total on top of the other stuff that I'm doing. But that's kind of you know, I, with Costa Rican tea positive, I don't want to flood the market. No, absolutely. So I'm I'm very selective about what I cross, and I keep a lot of what I produce, um, and therefore it means that people that are buying from me are buying something where the project's stable. So in fact. When I started selling Costa Rican tea positives um, four years ago or five years ago, the price since then has actually increased uh, up to about twenty seven hundred and fifty bucks from a thousand dollars that I was originally selling them for. for. Right. So the price has actually increased, and that's just for the visual tea positive. You know, yeah, you, you talk about the double hats for leopard and uh, Costa Rican tea or black eyed anthracitic and Costa Rican tea. There's not a lot of them about. They're really rare. There's only ten pairs. Uh, sorry, there's only eight pairs of uh, eight or nine pairs of the double hat Costa Rican tea positive leopards, and there's only uh, 2.4 pairs in the world of the double hat black hat anthracitic Costa Rican tea. So these things are not there's not a lot of them about. So there's a really kind of nice project not to ruin. Um, so I'm very selective about the breedings that I do. No, absolutely. And I think because you've been so selective, I think there's still a lot of potential with this project because it's being worked nice and slow. Yeah. And therefore, and, and there's so many ways you can take this project too. So I yeah, understand you know, that. Yeah, like I, while I don't work really with, with Colombian bow as much, what I did pick up this year were a couple of Aztec bows, um, Aztec Het Blood and Aztec Het Nicaraguan Tea. And I plan to put one of those Aztecs into the... Uh, into the Costa Rican tea as well. I think that would be kind of a cool combination. Huh. And I'd like to get, I'd like to get IMG. I've had a couple of IMG bows in the in the past, and I've either sold them or else they were not good whenever they came in. Um, so I wouldn't mind getting an IMG mail if anybody's looking to trade. Hit me up. And uh, and oh, today it was kind of weird. I was sitting thinking about um, about the labyrinth bows, and I think labyrinth could look really cool with the Costa Rican tea. I think that would be absolutely fantastic. Especially yeah. if you think about what Labyrinth does color-wise right. to right. the Colombian palette. Now imagine right. that on the Costa Rican palette it would be That's it. pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm tempted to hit up Jeff Ronnie. Jeff's a good friend of mine, <laughs> so I'm, I'm tempted to hit him up. You know, I almost did today, but I'm, I'm trying to you know, bite my tongue a bit. I'm, I'm trying to reduce the number of animals I've got, not increase it, and, and uh, I keep seeming to increase it. So Yeah, hence the great yeah. lie, my friend. The great lie. <laughs> So one of the things that I've been talking a lot about lately is the fact that, you know, we're kind of constantly seeing the popularity of Central American boas. Do you think they're going to continue uh, gaining traction and popularity because of their size and housing requirements? I think that's part of it. I think that and just the color palette that they're really starting to come in. You know, people are seeing them beyond just kind of the basic colors. Um, they're seeing some really interesting pattern morphs and combinations that make something that's really exciting. Uh, the fact that they're not... a aggressive that you know that's a, it's a common misconception just like you heard with reticulated pythons early on and right. blood pythons early on um through generations of captive breeding and selecting animals that are not aggressive and using those as your breeding stock you end up with you know pretty decent animals so i think i think all in all i think people are going to be looking at it and saying well if i want just one snake i can keep an adult female central american boa in a four foot by two foot by two foot or four foot by two foot by 18 inch enclosure all of its life and will have more than enough room that it ever needs um, and if they want to breed them for example if they wanted to go at it like the ball python kind of you know uh, cb70s then they can still do that as well you know i use for mine just simply a mix of freedom breeder uh, 70s and freedom breeder 90s and and there's more than enough room for the animals they really thrive and and, and obviously it's a very controlled environment so i I think there's, there's, like I've noticed it with the Costa Rican projects. I, I very rarely need to advertise. People come to me about them, and I haven't, I've never had a problem selling them. Um, I've had a lot of people wanting to trade. So I, like I did the, the stupid thing a couple of years ago, at least stupid for me, and I, I traded a bunch, and I ended up getting about seventy ball pythons that at the oh, time man. were like, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But these were, these were like, you know, at the time worth a bit of money, like bamboo crosses and you know GHI stuff and. Things right. that at the time were, were worth still a bit of money, um, 
and I produced a bunch of clutches, but I couldn't sell them for, you know, for, for an effort of trying, you know, it's just people don't know me for ball pythons. So last year I, I just sold all 70 ball pythons. My last one that I produced was a, uh, was last summer and it was a, uh, a bamboo hypomelanistic champagne. Oh, wow. It was, it was beautiful. Um, and I still, I love ball pythons, but I just, I don't see the point of me having them and breeding them and that kind of number if I can't even sell them. So yeah. no, that's completely know. understandable. Like I myself work with a very yeah, yeah. small amount of balls, but yeah, you know, it's yeah. more of a pet project than right. something that I'm hoping to, you know, gain any sort of financial uh, advantages yeah. from. Yeah, yeah. But so, I, I think I think there's a lot of opportunity for for them. I think uh, I think people are seeing that. You know, they don't want necessarily to have to go out and buy some of the large freedom breeder racks, you know, or cages, you know, with five foot drawers. Whenever they can have much smaller and and keep a few more or have less space. So I think I think you're going to see more people getting into that kind of hobby. No, and one of the things I think many of the people that are actually going to be coming over to uh, the Central American BOA side of the house is actually going to be people from the ball python industry, right? Because right. let's be completely honest. The ball python industry <laughs> is fantastic as far as what they've done financially. It's fantastic what, as far as what they've done with the color palette of the animals and the variances of the genes. Mm -hmm. But the ball python itself is a very mellow animal. Some right. would even say a little boring to house. Like yeah. with, with a yeah. boa, there's a, a level of intelligence. There's a level of inter interactivity that usually isn't always there with ball pythons. Well, obviously, um, there's, there's exceptions to the rule, but by yeah, and large. And I, I agree with you. And what's interesting is you know, I've sold Central American boas to a bunch of ball python breeders. Um, who have within a couple of years sold them on because they couldn't get them to breed the way they get their ball pythons to breed. Right. You know, you put two ball pythons in a wet paper bag and it will breed and produce a bunch <laughs> of eggs. And, yes, they and will. And bo boas aren't the same. Um, they don't function the same way. You know, I, I know that some people are lucky and they hit it off uh, and they they get them to breed easily. For some reason, I do that. I think it's just my room more than anything. Um, but with, with boas, they're just, there's a few more things that you got to do uh, and they're they're less tolerant of the well i'll say they're, they're more tolerant they can they can survive very happily in a wide range of temperatures and humidities and so on but they need a certain range to breed yeah they, and, they, have, and, they have specific breeding requirements and for a lot of ball yeah. python breeders that are simply used to pulling out their males you know right. during the middle of the winter and, and sticking them with a female and that's it right you know that's it. without paying attention to temperatures without that's really it. understanding kind of the effects of what you know the environment that they're presenting to the animals and, and they they're, and they're, they're settled for failure like yeah and, and also you can't use one male boa on 10 female boas right. it just doesn't work like that you know yeah um you might get two you might get three but you will see sperm count decreasing dramatically unless you can really manage the breeding so breeding using ultrasound um and but it's not, it doesn't work the same way as ball pythons. So people that get into it, I think they're getting into it for a financial reason, not for a real interest in, in that animal. And therefore, whenever they don't see the financial return immediately, because 80% of their animals didn't breed, then they quickly get out of it. Yeah. But I think that's going to change. I think people are going to realize that you know, many markets are saturated, and it's much better to, to have kind of controlled breedings and, and assume that not all of them are going to hit. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, let me ask you something, and, and I want to get your opinion on this. Do you think that as you start going into F2, F3, F4 generations of uh, boas, that some of those temperatures that are required for breeding might be, might slightly change? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think it can happen very quickly. You know, as long as you're raising an animal up from a baby in whatever room you're in, and you're keeping it at the room conditions then I think it will adapt to those very, very quickly. Um, you know, I've heard people tell me that Sonoran boas, boas need to get really cold and this and that. I do not regulate, I do not change my thermostats from an 86 or 88 degree hotspot, an ambient, um, what I'm looking for in general is an 84. Um, because I keep my animals in the basement here in Oklahoma, it'll get down to about 65 degrees in that room over the winter. So the front of the rack might be sitting about 72. Okay. The animals, they'll just regulate between that. They'll, they'll adapt to where, they'll choose where they need to go. And they're not going to sit in the cold end and freeze. And they're not going to sit in the warm end and cook. They'll regulate. Right. Um, I think animals will naturally adapt to the room conditions that you've got. I've bred Sonoran boas in North Carolina whenever the room was, throughout the year, was 75 degrees. Never got cooler than that. 72 degrees, never got cooler than that kind of thing. 
and I've read them here where it gets down to 65, you know, so, and they were, you know, probably a couple of generations in, but um, I don't think they, I think it's more the stability of your conditions and the way you cycle your animals and not overfeeding your animals. I think that's a major, a major problem is people just go in with their animals too fat to start off with. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so, yeah. So let's uh, pivot a little bit and talk a little bit about your work with Corrales. So what kind of drew you to Corrales boas? It was a picture in a one of the, I don't know if you remember the TFH books that were. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, so there was there was one. I was trying to remember the name of it. It, it had a Timor python on the cover, and it might have been like captive breeding of boas and pythons, something like that. But in the, the inner the inner cover picture was a, a an orange and yellow uh, Amazon tree boa. And... Uh, and I just thought that's pretty cool. I uh, I wouldn't mind kind of seeing if I could get one of those. And at the time, my friend Jonathan Harvey back in Northern Ireland was bringing in animals from our friend Clive, and he was able to bring in wild caught um, Amazon tree boas, which were then called garden tree boas, mm-hmm. even though they were yellow and so. And I I got a trio of them, and uh, I started playing with those. And while they were aggressive and they were crazy, I just kind of felt they were amazing. I thought the body structure was cool, or the arboreal lifestyle was neat. And I and I bred them, and, and again, just like breeding Sonoran boas, it was totally unintentional. I picked up a a really absurdly large female, one that I thought was absurdly large at the time, was about five feet long and would eat kind of medium rats, and I um, or maybe small to medium rats, so kind of pretty big for an Amazon tree boa. And I had it in, a, in a, these really cool glass enclosures that a friend of mine would build for me that were two foot by two foot by two foot. And uh, one day after uh, after school, I was cleaning out the male's cage so I moved the male into the female and I started cleaning it within seconds he locked with her this lasted maybe 45 minutes and then once they separated I put him back into his enclosure and a couple of days later I fed the female a medium rat it was kind of I thought was slightly too big for it but I fed it a medium rat and then uh, a week later she ovulated and then produced, I think, 19 babies. Oh, get out of here. Yeah. So from one 45-minute long. One 45-minute breeding. That's insane. <laughs> and uh, That's and that gave me this color palette of animals, you know, these yellow and orange bicolors and these cool red ones. And I held back a bunch of those and traded a bunch of those. And and, and I started picking up other ones and picking up uh, emerald tree bows, northern emeralds at the time as well. And uh, you got to realize at this point, this is like 1999, maybe 98, I couldn't give away a solid red Amazon tree bow. I could... In Northern Ireland and the UK, I could not give those things away, so I just kept keeping them back and getting more. and And I, I just thought they were amazing animals. I thought they were very easy to keep, very forgiving in in their and how how you keep them. You know, they 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 are animals that truly thrive on neglect. So, you know, you feed it every two or three weeks and you leave them alone. And uh, it was for me, it was hard whenever I sold all of those group of animals before I moved to the US because I built up a really exceptional collection that I bred through maybe four generations, three generations. And uh, it was nice in the US finally, you know, I really put an effort into it about three years ago, was kind of reacquiring uh, tree boas. Um, so since then I've, you know, I've picked up, you know, a nice group of northern emeralds and I've got a gravid female at the moment. Uh, I picked up some nice Amazons, you know, the leopards and the tigers and the calicos and stuff like that. But my real focus of that group are, are a species known as Corallus ruschenbergeri. Um, these get big, they get about seven feet. The females uh, can eat easily medium rats. My female in my lab, my largest Costa Rican female, will eat um, kind of large rats. Um, you can imagine the size of the head on these things. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I, I've probably got the most genetically diverse group maybe in the world because we've got um, the Costa Rican animals, I've got Venezuelan animals, and then myself and a friend um, imported on a scientific permit uh, 10 from Trinidad about six months ago or seven months ago, and these are the only ones to have come in from Trinidad in maybe 25 years. Um, they're undoubtedly the only 10 in the U.S., and probably there's probably less than less than 45 or 50 in the world in captivity. Um, and most of them will be in Trinidad. So um, a very, very rare animal, but they are seven feet long and solid gold in color. Wow. Um, and aggressive, you know, these are kind of scrub python aggression, you know, they'll open up the enclosure and they try and eat you, you know, but. Oh yeah, no, no, I understand. But I, the... I just, I'm just taken by them, you know, just really cool animals. 
Yeah, no, and I think they're starting to develop like a cult following within yeah, the states. Yeah. You know, I, every year it seems like more of the longtime boa breeders that I know of have started getting into them. Yeah. Because I remember them when they were, you know, twenty dollars snakes Absolutely. At, in the nineties yeah. during snake during snake shows. And as you said, you know, everybody yeah. couldn't give them away. The yeah. yeah. They weren't yeah. really moving. They were always really <laughs> bright colored, but I think their yeah. attitude intimidated people, and I think the fact that they looked frail, yeah. even though they weren't. No, right, not at all. Yeah. That I think also kind of intimidated people, but I think now is when people are really kind of getting in on the ground floor with this species. Yeah, I think so. And like, what concerned me a bit was, um, you know, whenever these color and pattern more started popping out, I, I started getting afraid that people were going to look at them like ball pythons, and I hate to see it. That you know, I, I I've watched some of these YouTube. Um, shows and I see people keeping them in CB70 racks right and, yeah and I you know these animals people will turn around and say oh yeah my Amazon stays in the ground 70 or 80 percent of the time well it does that because you're not providing it with the suitable enclosures that it requires correct my Amazons are very rarely on the ground because I provide a network of branches for them to constantly be in it and the temperatures that they require to allow them to move between that and feel comfortable so describe how you house them a little bit for those people who might be interested in potentially picking picking up some some yeah so it varies but what i aim for for an adult amazon would be a two foot by two foot two foot deep two foot high and and either two foot wide or 18 inch wide uh, enclosure um you know you can build that out of whatever you want whether it's it's well sealed wood or whether it's a pvc plastic kind of material or glass um, that gives them enough room to play around with i like to go bigger um so a two foot by two foot by two foot would be what i would shoot for for a minimum um for the Trinidad tree bows, what I'm uh, building at the moment, are six foot tall, three foot wide, and two foot deep, um, simply because they're really big act, uh, really big animals that are pretty active. It's almost like um, an emerald tree bow enclosure for them. Yeah, but emeralds are actually much less active, so my emeralds yeah. I keep in two foot cubes. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, and, and, and they, you know, they, pr they require a, a much different kind of perch setup. You know, people keep them with much, you know, the, the diameter of the perch is much too thick, you know, you, they like really thin perches. Um, Whereas the Corallus Frischenbergeri and the Amazons just like a, a network, like a, like a meshwork of branches that they can kind of drape themselves over. The Frischenbergeri actually perch much closer to emeralds than, than Amazons, but um, I think people don't give them enclosures that are big enough. Mm. Um, you know, I quarantine all of my stuff in, in just kind of Sterlite or Rubbermaid kind of enclosures, the kind of if I can get the 40 gallon or something like that there, and they do really well in that, and then I'll move them up whenever it's time. Um, you know, they're active animals, so people think that they're an arboreal snake, so therefore they're not doing much of this perched on a tree. But Amazons and, and Rischenberger are, are actually quite active. Uh, mm. and whenever I go into my room at night, those things are all over the place. They're constantly moving. Um, so I, I, I split my group between my lab. So I, in my office, in my lab, I keep a decent group of the Costa Rican uh, Rischenberger and some emeralds. And then in my house, I've got uh, lots more uh, Rischenberger eye, and then I've got Amazons and, and Emeralds here as well. Um, but temperature-wise, I, I shoot for an ambient of about 84 degrees. Um, so there'll be a hot spot hotter than that, there'll be a cool end, you know, the, the bottom of the cage will be cooler than that. I like to put in a lot of foliage, so just plastic kind of foliage, mm -hmm. or so foliage is fine. I'll generally put in like a live pothos plant into all of the enclosures, because that just helps with some air flow, air turnover. And then I will uh, in my lab, you know, being relatively dry here, I use an ultrasonic humidifier that I've rigged up where it pumps into all of my enclosures every day for an hour in the morning, uh, and that provides like a, a dew kind of on the on the leaves that the animals right. can drink from. Um, and then about twice a week or three times a week, I've got a pro mist system that will come on and mist the substrate um, for about uh, five minutes or less, four or five minutes. Uh, but I don't spray them every night. I don't think you need to. Um, and then I feed them, you know, every two weeks kind of thing. You know, whenever, it's funny, whenever I got in the, the Trinidad Russian burger, I, I actually fed them every five days because they're wild caught. And I, I haven't wormed them yet. They've been with me for maybe six or seven months. Um, I treated them for external parasites, but the animals are, are gaining weight. Um, and I'm only going to, I'll do a fecal on them in a couple of months' time, but... I just wanted to put weight on them. I think people will treat wild caught snakes far too early, and that causes um, problems with the animals. Right. I think you, as long as they're feeding and they're passing food, and there's no real problems there. I think you can hold off on on treating them for internal parasites. That's pretty much it. I, again, I think they're very easy to keep. You know, it's uh, 
I think people overthink it a lot. You know, I think people worry about, I suppose it depends on their room, but I think people worry about night drops too, too much. And I think they, they worry about, you know, humidity too much. For a lot of it, I think food is the, food is the key. You know, I've been in the tropics enough. Every year I, I teach a course in, in a rainforest in Costa Rica. And I can tell you that the temperatures don't change. No matter what time of the year you go, the temperatures don't change. Not where it's noticeable. Um, but what does change is food availability. Right. So gorging for a period, eating kind of, kind of sparsely for a period, and then fasting for a long period, I think is key. So regardless of my animal uh, species that I keep, apart from the, the hognose snakes, every other thing that I've got will go on at least a three or a four month period of not feeding. And after that, they'll, as I say, my adult boas, my, my adult Costa Ricans, the Sonorans, will feed once a month. Uh, the males will feed once a month. And then as we go down in year, um, you know, like a two-year-old will feed every three weeks. A yearling will feed every two weeks. A baby will feed every 10 days. And I, and I, and I stop feeding my, all of my animals from November through to February. It doesn't matter what, if it's a baby or an adult, they all go through the same fasting. Got it. So, uh, real quick, let's talk about your work at the Booth Lab. Um, kind of let us know some of the highlights of your work and maybe touch on <coughs> the 2011 paper that you did. Yeah, so, you know, it's kind of funny that that snake paper, it's kind of fortuitous. It's almost like the time when I bred the Sonorans or the, or the Amazons for the first time. It, it's something that wasn't really meant to happen. Right. Uh, my lab, you know, I'm a population and evolutionary geneticist. And... What I'm interested in is how populations form and how gene flow occurs and kind of the characteristics that make them kind of interesting, right? Um, so we work a lot. My lab is really primarily focused on how organisms adapt and evolve in urban settings. So, like so we actually bugs, work, right? yeah, so we work a lot with urban pests um, because we can get a lot of them and we can do some really cool things with their genomics. But um, maybe 2009, uh, I was contacted, Jeff Ronnie is a good friend of mine, and he called me up and said, look, um, I've got a friend who had a, produced a, a boa litter, and, uh, you know, she had four males with it, and she wants to know who the father is, and, and at this point, I'm sitting thinking, right, academic jobs in 2009 were just non-existent, yeah. and, and I thought, right, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a postdoc, uh, my, my position was a postdoctoral researcher, kind of the in-between before you try and get a faculty position. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, it looks like I'll never get a faculty position because they're just non-existent. So what, what's going to happen? I'm going to end up doing paternity tests. And then a day later, <laughs> Jeff Ronnie calls me up and asks me about doing a paternity test That's on a funny. bloody snake. Now, I developed the markers for identifying parents, essentially, or that can be used for that a year earlier um, for a collaboration uh, with a project that I did looking at boas on uh, Cozumel and also Hog Island or the Hog Islands, the Chaos Coquinos. So I had those markers, so I said, look, collect shed skins, send them to me, and I'll tell you who the father is. Well, after doing the, the DNA genotyping, it proved that there was no father and it was part of the genetic. They were all female. This was from Sharon Moore, who, who produced the Boa Woman Caramel line. Um, so Sharon asked me what, you know, what I would charge for it, and I said, just give me one of the, one of the part of the genetic caramels, and she did. Uh, so we were finishing up I, that study. I was writing up the paper, and then she called me up and was like, "You're not going to believe it, but she did it again." Wow! So a year later, she then produced, I think, ten more. So in total, there might have been twenty-two parthenogens. Uh, and we published that paper. It went into Biology Letters, and it, and it went all over the world, and uh, in the ter terms of the media, um, because it was the first time it had been documented in boas. Um, there's, there was very little work done on parthenogenesis in snakes in general prior to that. Uh, some of the work was kind of more speculative, and the work that was done on pythons was really quite shady whenever we, we got into it. Um, or not shady, but more sketchy. Yeah. Uh, if that's really different, shady and sketchy. Well, anyway, we proved later that that paper wasn't right anyway, but the boa paper um, really took off. And a friend of mine who, was, who had done his PhD in the same lab that I did my PhD in was a shark geneticist, and, and he had discovered parthenogenesis in hammerhead sharks. And he said whenever his paper came out, he just got inundated by zoos and aquariums about similar situations happening in their facilities. Well, within a week or two, that happened with me, and people were emailing me and telling me about these ball pythons and reticulated pythons and all these other animals that they had in their collections that were producing what they didn't expect to produce. The great thing I will say about snake breeders, many of them don't even have a high school education, and yet they can understand Mendelian genetics perfectly. 
so they knew exactly what they should be producing and whenever they didn't produce it or they produced something that they shouldn't have produced I, I was getting these emails and I still do and I would tell them just to save the shed skins and keep the details and send them to me and, and that really exploded so from documenting it once in boas we then documented it in rainbow boas and in uh you know, reticulated pythons and rattlesnakes and copperheads and cottonmouths and all of these different species. And it got to the point where people were just sending me so many samples. And, and I still get maybe two or three times a month, I get samples coming in. <laughs> and it's great because I can just give those to undergraduates to work on and they, it gives them experience in DNA yeah, extraction. That's the lovely thing about see. having grad students. Absolutely. And undergrads. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and for me, it moved away from my... I kind of started getting bored with this kind of, I, I, I kind of described it like stamp collecting, you know, where it was like, well, here's another species that does it, and here's another one that does it. And it, it turned out that snakes do it a lot. Um, they really do it a lot, especially boas and pythons. And uh, it's not uncommon at all where people thought it was. Um, so what we've done from there, we've actually taken it a little bit further. And what we're working on really now is uh, we finished up a paper a couple of years ago about what it does to venom in uh, in in uh, in venomous snakes, so we worked on copperheads, and we looked at what we, you know, whenever you get this genome-wide reduction in genetic diversity, you would expect that that's going to really screw up venom genes, because there's a lot of venom genes, and we it proved that it doesn't do anything really, and the venom is still very functional. Hmm. Um, I uh, we're working now on actually understanding the genomic mechanisms that drive it. Um, I've actually that boa woman caramel that I had, I raised it at, at nine years old. I got it to breed. Um, and we produce babies from it, sexually produce babies from it. Uh, we're raising those up, and because there's a theory that that it might be a heritable trait, so we'll really? know in a couple of years' time whether it's a heritable trait. But the boa woman caramel parthenogen was just out of this world. It was bright orange in its tail, and uh, you know, just phenomenal snake. But what I will say is that general parthenogens are terrible. That that boa woman caramel did not recover from the pregnancy. And she died a couple of months later, and she had a very odd pregnancy. She would sit on the cool end more than the warm end. Um, the the labor was very um, strained. She had four stillborns and five live. But what that did do, actually, that 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 birth was, it was we were able to sh use that to show that that snakes, that boas and pythons actually have X Y sex chromosomes, not Z W, which was mm. assumed across snakes. So it, it kind of rewrites the the biology books, you know. Um, so we're still playing with that stuff. We just. I, I don't try and do too much of it um, because it's something that I'm not going to be able to get a National Science Foundation grant for. So it's money that's coming from my own lab kind of research budget that would be uh, that would be doing that work. So um, nowadays we're not doing a lot. We're, we're still doing a lot of work on snakes. So we're about to name a couple of new species of python. Uh, we're about to split up a major python species into multiple species. Um, what else have we done? We've done a lot of work on boas on islands with a collaborator down in UT Arlington. Um, so we did the, you know, we, we classified boas into the boa sigma and boa imperator and so on. So these are all, it's all, I kind of describe it like hobby research. You know, it's yeah. what I do at the weekend and in the evenings and because um, it's just fun. But it's cool because it's, you know, parthenogenesis was something in 2010 that people didn't think of. And now among snake keepers, they actually think of it quite a lot because they're seeing it quite a lot. Um, what I what I don't like to see are the people that are knowingly producing litters of parthenogens and then selling those animals and sometimes right. for a lot of money because those animals I can tell you I've got over forty parthenogens and all of them are residing in my freezer in my lab mm. so they die between a couple of months and maybe up to nine years they might reproduce but that's a very very poor reproductive mode and I've I've got this in ball pythons as well so I had parthen genetic ball pythons. And they all now reside in my freezers, so they're not a long-term viable animal. Um, and I know people that, that um, think it's great that their animal produces parthen genetically and then sell them for a lot of money. And I think that's kind of a, a pretty shoddy thing to do. Yeah, no, definitely, man. Now, yeah. uh, you said that you guys are doing a little bit of uh, venom research. Um, have you guys considered maybe uh, seeing how venom is developing through uh, populations of the same species of snakes? So, for example, like Mojave Rattlers like how the venom is different from one area to another? Yeah, that's a good that question. So, so I, I don't, um, but we're working on a proposal right now with a, a large group of collaborators um, on hybrid rattlesnakes and hybrid zones, mm. and, and it would involve venom research. So I've got a lot of friends that actually work on that, that kind of topic. 
and it's pretty fascinating you know like the the different types of, of mojave venom is really cool um and and after seeing the the work that we that we generated on um on copperheads you know it's interesting to then consider what's happening actually just across the population in general and then if we look at kind of small inbred populations versus large outbred populations i think i think it's kind of a really fascinating topic it's just one that it, it's not an area that i've got into just because i've got so many projects going oh, yeah. as it is and and it would be very easy you know i'm very easily distracted yeah and therefore it would be very easy for me to immerse myself in <laughs> in a new project and in fact my my latest national science foundation grant was just due to a distraction it ended up getting me a lot of money you know over half a million dollars in funding but it was it was purely a distraction from another project that did it so while that was beneficial then i don't want to be distracted too often you know i've got a lot of work to try and wrap up and and keep going so uh the snakes stay as a hobby and uh really now a lot of the work that we do we do through collaborations with other labs so i'm stepping back from that to focus more on really the stuff going on in the urban evolution setting within within my lab now that that doesn't mean that we we'll, we will ultimately end up not working on snakes because i'm really fascinated about how urban populations of copperheads are surviving and how they differ from natural populations so we're busy over time collecting samples of urban copperheads and copperheads from natural populations and, and maybe at some point we'll do a project with that because I think there's going to be genes that are upregulated and downregulated in urban settings and they might be a totally different set of genes than we would be seeing in, uh, in natural kind of rural areas just because huh. they, need to, they need to cope with things like different prey availability, right, fat right. at your prey, um, you know, heavy metal pollution, that kind of thing. So I think we're going to see different, we, we see that happening already in lots of other organisms and I think snakes are going to be no different. All right. So let's pivot back uh, back to the hobby. Um, so give me some lessons that you've learned uh, when you started doing this and when you started breeding snakes. What are the lessons? I think, I think for myself, the biggest lesson was just plan out your breedings. So whenever I'm sitting down and thinking about what I want to produce, I'm not thinking about what I want to produce next year. I'm thinking about what I want to produce in four or five years' time. So therefore, I generate crosses that will ultimately allow me to generate the crosses down the line. Um, and I think that's beneficial because it means that I'm thinking pretty far ahead in terms of the projects that I've got. I'm not being kind of blindsided by saying, well, if I pair this to this, I can make these dollar signs. You know, instead, I'm thinking I can make these double heads that nobody will care about. But four or five years later, I can make this other animal, which would be remarkable. And that's what's right. happened with some of the animals that I'm working with. And then animals that I've got um, to keep the project viable, I actually wholesale a lot of animals that are double hat or triple hat or hat for virtually nothing. And what I'll do is I'll send males out to one person and females out to a different person on the other side of the country. And they'll just be Central American boas, you know, 35 mm -hmm. bucks wholesale, right. that kind of thing. Uh, because um, that way I'm keeping a small group of animals that I'm then going to cross to produce, you know, these crosses and uh, once I've got that, then I can actually produce animals that I can sell to people and feel comfortable with selling to people for higher prices. Um, I'm not saturating the market. Uh, and uh, and the, very, the likelihood that somebody is going to buy a boa from this person and another boa from somebody on the other side of the country from a different uh, wholesaler is very slim. So I do that. You know, I, I don't see the point in, in holding back everything. Like People are holding on to everything and trying to get big money for them. People think about dollar signs a lot in this hobby and I, I don't at all um, I would rather be holding back you know 10 animals that I know I can sell than keeping back 60 animals that it's going to take me a long time to sell right um, so by managing my breedings not to produce not to overproduce uh, a single specific thing and then by wholesaling uh, down to a smaller group that is uh, you know wholesaling the possible hats and stuff like that um, it gives me a, a better group to work with and to be able to offer a product to the people that want to buy that now uh, where do you think the future of the hobby is moving towards or where would you like it to move towards yeah that's a really good question you know over the last 25 years that i've been in this it's changed a lot you know we've seen these big breeders kind of come and go and it's kind of crazy you know you look i think back 20 years ago and the people that, that i was watching were like dave and tracy barker and peter Kyle and rich eiley and brian sharp and you know, part of the reason is that we're not seeing those is just age. You know, some of these people are moving out of it because they're just getting older and they don't want to have that right. large collection. But I think, I think the market's not there the way it was then. 
So I think I think what's going to happen is people hopefully are going to be much more selective about what they breed and don't just try and breed for the sake of breeding. Like I, it frustrates me whenever I see people contacting me to tell me they've got a boa and they just want another one to breed to it. I just don't sell them. You know, it's, <laughs> there's no there's no there's no point in that. So I I hope the I hope the hobby is going to move into a much more selective phase where people are kind of thinking about their projects much more carefully and not overproducing. Um, I think that uh, people are thinking a lot more about their enclosures now. Like you're seeing a lot about these bi bioactive enclosures for a lot of animals. It's not going to work for boas. It's not going to work for tree boas really. They can look really nice. So instead of just keeping them in boxes, they can actually make them look somewhat nice. Um, and I, I think moving the market seems to be moving away a bit from the ball python craze that happened. Um, which I think is healthy. I, th I think ball pythons are still great animals, but it's nice going into reptile shoes and seeing diversity again. You know, oh yeah. A really good friend of mine is, is Bob Ashley, and Bob um, co-organizes the NARBC shows, and it's nice going down. Like just four hours for me is the um, the Arlington show, so I'll go to that. You know, maybe once a year, and it's nice to go in and and see diversity again, and not just see ball python after ball python. Um, so I, I think we're seeing some of that coming back again. You know, if you picked up any of the old reptiles magazines or the reptile and amphibian hobbyist magazines from the late 90s or the early 2000s, and they would show pictures of Daytona that year, there was a whole plethora of different animals on it, um, real diversity of animals that were really cool, whereas 10 years ago or 12 years ago, it was just ball pythons. And I think that put a lot of people off. So I think the hobby moving to much more diversity again is pretty cool. It's kind of neat seeing people focusing on corn snakes. It's cool seeing people focusing on king snakes, things that are not necessarily high dollar, but um, they're animals that are interesting and they add diversity to the whole kind of hobby. Oh, no, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, funny you should mention that. So uh, my uh, kid's birthday uh, was last week and I got him some milk snakes. Oh, and, cool. Yeah. yeah, so they end up, it was a pair of T-positive uh, uh Nelson and I and uh, yeah they're beautiful yeah yes. beautiful snakes right so they bring them in and I've I've always been a boa guy through and through and uh, they end up uh, coming in and I catch myself later that afternoon just looking at Nelson and I morphs and all yeah. sorts of stuff like oh boy yeah this I, is uh, happening <laughs> I know I, I it, it does it to me the, the first ever snakes that I bred uh, 25 years ago were western hognose snakes and it was so funny because how I did that was hilarious you know I the first snake I got was a male western hognose and a friend of mine, I worked in a reptile store and a friend of mine had a female western hognose and we were like, well, why don't we try to breed them? And all we knew is that they needed to be cooled down or brominated right. over, the win over the winter. I didn't really have the ability to do that in my house in Belfast, so what I did, uh, my parents had divorced and, and I was living with my mom and we were renovating this house and I literally went to under the stairs, there was a, a little closet type thing. I went in, I unscrewed the floorboards, <laughs> and I put this, you know, two foot polystyrene box with these two snakes in it under the floorboards of this house for three months with just a water bowl and the snakes. And I left them alone. So in Northern Ireland, over the winter when it gets down, you know, it's snowing or whatever, these things were just under there. Yeah, and then three months later, I took them out, put them together, and they double clutched and produced twenty four eggs. That's and, hilarious. And twenty four hatch. That's hatched. hilarious, man. And it's it's again, it's just remarkable the way we do things. Now I'd be th thinking, right? Well, I need to build a a refrigerator with a cooling system and install temperature regulated. Man, those things didn't care. They bred and they did great. But um, last year at the Arlington show in September, I was down, and uh, it was kind of an odd show. Uh, you know, Bob. Uh, and Sherry Ashley kind of gave me this VIP ticket, and I, you know, I was wandering around. And Tracy Barker, who's a good friend of mine, gave me a, a, a pair of the caramel uh, albino Sumatran short tails for free oh, as yeah. a gift. Yeah. And then another friend gave me a pair of Brazilian rainbow boas and a female emerald tree boa, adult emerald. And I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? And then I did buy a pair of snakes. I bought an, an ex uh, exanthic head snow. Western hog nose and a <laughs> albino head exanthic Western hog nose. Babies, you know, the size of toothpicks. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm, it's funny because I got them home and I was like, shit, in my freezer, I've only got, you know, small, medium, and large rats. So I had to go out and buy these pinky mice. And, uh, but those things I love and I still find myself going on to kingsnake.com or fauna classifieds or morph market and looking at, you know, these different morphs that are available in it. And I keep reining myself back in saying, right, you don't need this one. Don't do it. You know, it's easy to fall down that rabbit hole. Oh, yeah, it is. And I don't want to do it. You know, I, 
Yeah, it's uh, it's funny, but there's so many cool animals, and and the the T positive Nelson and I, they're they're something I keep looking at because the color. I like T positive um, morphs. Yeah, and I look I look at the color of those, and I'm like, you know, if only a pair. You only need a pair. Realistically, you only need one, right? Yeah, the pro- the problem is I'm <coughs> supposed to be focusing on COVID patients right now, and yeah, yeah, right. in between patients, I'm on kingsnake.com <laughs> right. looking and, at book snakes. I'm the same, you know, at the university, we went to virtual learning a couple of weeks ago as a result of this. So I'm converting yeah, all same, of my lectures. Same, same at the university here. Yeah, recording them all, you know, and it's funny because I can go and give a lecture normally, a lecture three times a week for two classes, three 50-minute lectures twice, basically. And yeah. I can just walk in, not even think about it, just rattle off the lecture. Now that I'm recording it, I'm actually going back and thinking about it. I'm scripting it. I'm recording it. I'm re-recording it. It's a pain in the ass. You know, yeah, what should is. take 50 minutes has taken me five hours. And in between that, I'm like, oh, I wonder what's on Morph Market or I wonder what's on, you know, Fauna Classified. Oh, fauna, then, yeah. oh <laughs> man, it's, it's, yeah, I need to, I need to stop doing that, you know, but, but uh, yeah, colubrids, I think are a lot of fun. I think there's some really cool snakes. That, well, I've, I've uh, managed cool. to avoid colubrids up to this point with the exception of yeah. uh, indigos. I've always kept indigos, but. I like yeah, those. Yeah. Like, I think it's, yeah. I, I think it's good to step outside your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think we get very pigeonholed with the animals we keep, and I think it's nice stepping away from that and and seeing something different. You know, something like with a colubrid, you have to feed it every five or seven days. They just do not do the way they don't cope with the month long absence of food that boas would do because the whole digestive system is totally different. Absolutely. So I so I think um, I think you know it's it's nice to kind of step back and say, well, this is kind of cool. How do I how do I do this and how do I do it right? Um, so I do like. I do like working with these little hog nose and I, there's a bunch of the milk snake things that I could easily get into. Um, the problem is, of course, because they eat so much, they crap so much. Yeah. And the last thing, I, at one point in my life, I had about 60 corn snakes and I produced a lot of corn snakes every year for the pet stores in Northern Ireland and I do not want to go through that process again. My room stank oh, yeah. of freaking corn snake poo and I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not into that. But... Yeah, I like the I like the milk snakes. I think you made the right choice there. They're they're pretty cool. Yep. All right, brother. We're gonna take a quick break, and then uh, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of having genetic diversity in your collection. Sure. All right, guys, welcome back. Now we're going to talk about the importance of having genetic diversity in your collection. One of the biggest issues we see within the reptile industry is the lack of genetic diversity within collections themselves. This can cause a series of inbreeding depression problems such as kinking, inability to thrive, and a host of potential other problems that are usually swept under the rug by many breeders. Warren, let's talk a little bit about why genetic diversity is such an important thing. Well, very simply, lacking genetic diversity kind of increases inbreeding, right? The animals are essentially highly inbred whenever they lack genetic diversity within their own genome. Um, and we can think about any inbred population that we can think of, right? And in humans, it's quite common to think about certain populations that have got six fingers or webbing and stuff like that, detrimental uh, to an extent. Um, the issue is that as we lose genetic diversity, we increase homozygosity across the genome. And therefore, we increase the likelihood that we've got sometimes just mildly deleterious genes, so mildly detrimental genes becoming fixed in the homozygous condition, and you're not losing those. So while on its own a single mutation might not affect anything, in combination with another it might cause kinking, or it might cause a loss of eye, or it Mm. might cause spinal fusion, uh, metabolic problems. And these are things that are often swept under the rug. You know, the amount of times that I see people saying, oh, yeah, the, the eye swelling in, in, in albinos, that's just, a, that's just one of those things. It's not one of those things. It's an inbreeding thing. Right. Um, Especially the eye loss and eye swelling. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know, tail kinking here and there and so on. I'm one of the few people that actually has sequenced genomes of captive animals. So we've done a lot of genomic work on boas and pythons. And I can tell you that captive animals are not very genetically diverse. No matter what we think about it, they're not very genetically t- diverse. So we should be thinking about how can we maximize diversity within our groups. And for some reason, for some, and sometimes it's, that's not easy. Um, animals that are coming in with a small founding pool are, are often, everything after that is inbred, often many, many generations. 
and you might not see an effect early on, but over time, because mutations are continually accruing, whenever those mutations accrue, it can actually lead to detrimental effects. Um, you know, how many times have you produced a litter and the best one has been that runty little animal and you do your best to save that thing? Absolutely, yeah. In the wild, that would not happen. And yet we do our best to retain that. And realistically, they're the ones that are hardest to get feeding or they don't shed very well, but we just want to get them because it's a male and we want it to breed. You know, it's we don't help ourselves. And, uh, you know, I was selling some hog island boas this past uh, couple of weeks ago. And people were contacting me asking me what line the hog island boas were. You know, they could be Shewitt line or Sears line or Lemke line. And I said, well, why is it you want to know? And they said, well, I just want to keep my Sears line pure. And I said, so you're, you support inbreeding? I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> we, just, we want to have a diverse group of Sears animals. And I said, you got to realize That's that the Sears animals are founded by <laughs> such a small group of animals, you know? And, and therefore, what you should be trying to do is outbreed to these other lines. And then from what you produce, select back and say, well, this one had the best pink tail and so on. But create a genetically diverse group. There's an argument that's been going around recently, and it kind of concerns me. And that is, well, you know, there's these boas on island that have got really small populations, but they survive. And they're highly inbred, so therefore inbreeding's fine. It's not the case. Um, there are lineages that will have lost um, deleterious uh, mutations or deleterious alleles sorry and just through selection over time however that doesn't mean that that means that every boa can do that um, this is a hit or miss this is a random roll of the dice so therefore you inbreeding your animals through five generations is not a good thing you should always take the opportunity to outbreed whenever you can and whenever that's possible and it might not be uh, it might not mean that you're going to get to your target goal the fastest, but it, it should at least increase diversity a little bit. Um, and sadly, with, with boas, we often have a very small founding group of many things. But how many times do people call you up and say, you know, I want to get a pair of those from that litter because I want to breed them? You know, so it, it's instead of saying, you know, I want to get one this time and then whenever you breed that to a different animal, I'll get another one. And at least then there'll be half sibs, right, instead of full sibs. Uh, so I try to, whenever I'm breeding animals, I try to breed uh, to multiple females to be able to offer unrelated pairs. Well, sorry, not unrelated pairs, but at least half-sibling pairs. Um, that just maintains diversity a little bit better. I've got enough of a group of animals that are that are out across the different animals to be able to then offer um, pretty, you know, they're not going to be 100% unrelated, but they're going to be not full sibs necessarily. So I think we should be trying our best to do it. Uh, it's not always easy, so it's not as if I can turn around and say, you know, I can just go out tomorrow and get another uh, unrelated West Snake Key boa, considering right. there's only a couple that have brought into the into captivity, or Crawl Key, or Lagoon Key. You know, it's not easy to do that. But we need to be careful at that point in, in, in terms of what we then select for breeding. So don't necessarily try to, you know, be, be a little bit less selective about what we cross is a better way to put it right don't necessarily try to fix traits try to create diversity within litters now let me ask you are there any specific morphs that you see out there for sale in the marketplace that you uh, essentially to yourself worry that they're at risk for further problems so like one i, I think there's within, obvious ones yeah, yeah i think there's i think you know sadly motley is the case right uh, you know people for years have said no we'll outbreed them and we'll be able to make these viable super motleys it'll never happen it's just that is associated with the trait period right the super motley will never be a viable animal um and if if you get one that survives long enough it's going to be a rare animal and i had six super motley black-eyed anarthristics that were given to me by bill gaines and over time, those animals all, they did well up until about three foot, and then they all just went downhill. And I can tell you, they looked mm. like crap. Um, uh, head musculature started degrading. Uh, spinal fusion was occurring. Uh, kind of neck morphology was weird. Um, super motleys will never work, period. Uh, I'm worried about the scoria boas. Yeah, and, and I think there's, I think a lot of people have been concerned with the scoria boas, and I've heard the yeah. same argument about them. You know, people are saying, but... You know, most of my animals didn't show head wobble. Well, most doesn't mean anything to me because it's like spider balls. It's like, you know, jaguar uh, carpet pythons. Right. Um, even if they don't show it, whenever they reproduce, their off offspring can show it. 
Um, so, and that sucks. And again, it's not going to be a case of outbreeding it. I think that's just simply fixed with the trait. Um, so I think there's lines of animals or, or morphs that are going to be problematic. I think there's ones that we can't help. Albinos, we should be outcrossing. Yeah. You know, the anastheristics, you'd be out crossing whenever we can. Um, but I, I, I think, uh, you know, there's some tail kinking you see in other things. Uh, but I, the key ones that I think of are the, um, are the Scoria and the, uh, and the Motleys. And right. the Aztecs, of course, the Super Aztecs. Um, another one that I've been thinking about lately is I don't see a lot of Super Roswells. Mm. And, or Super Roswell ladder tails, whatever. You know, you think about when they were first produced, maybe eight years ago. Um, that's a lot of times, and there's a lot of Roswell ladder tails in the market, and I do not see anybody posting adult Roswell ladder tails. Super, the super um, form of that, the super Roswells. Yeah. Um, so I question the viability of those long term, and I hope someone can prove me wrong. Uh, but from the early litters that were produced, um, nearly every baby died very quickly. They had very large yolk bellies, uh, and they didn't thrive. Uh, and again, I think that was part of the trait. It's not just part of the care of the individual. Um, so I, I think there are ones that we could see. It's the same thing in ball pythons, the same thing in carp pythons, the same thing in reticulated pythons. Um, inbreeding doesn't help it, but there are certain traits that are just not thrive, that will not thrive in a homozygous form. No, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about uh, one of your favorite genes that does thrive and do, does really well, which is the Costa Rican T-positive. So give us a little bit of background of uh, the Costa Rican T-positive gene, how you first became aware of it and what kind of drew you to it. So that was probably uh, maybe 13 or 14 years ago. And it was an advert on kingsnake.com. Um, I forget the name of the, the person selling it, but they... They had it on that and a heterozygous animal. And I, uh, it, you know, it looked nice. It looked different. And I bought it. And, I, you know, I just had it in the corner of the room and I raised it up. And, uh, and I didn't do much with it early on for the first couple of years. Um, it was very different. The sheen, whenever you kind of hold it in the light, was very different. Mm -hmm. um, people have been saying that it was compatible with the Nicaraguan T-positives that I already had. But I didn't try and cross them early on. Um, but I just kind of raised it up and then I started thinking about what I should do with it. So I started, uh, maybe, sorry, let, let me backtrack a little bit further. Um, before I started breeding it to other things, I, uh, I was at Tindley, uh, maybe 10 or 11 years ago and I walked past one of these random tables and, uh, and on that table they had two animals that were identical to what was sold to me as a Costa Rican tea positive. Right. At this point I, in time, I had no clue that it was really a Costa Rican tea positive. It could have been a Nicaraguan, it could have been a Panamanian. Um, and I'll tell you how we got to understanding it was Costa Rican later on, but I, uh, I bought those as well. And that meant I had two males and a female. And I started looking around my collection and seeing what I had um, in regards to like leopard and hypomelanistic and blood and Inca and so on. And I I started planning these different breedings about how I would get to, as I say, not the next generation, but the one after that. And I started making these crosses and holding back babies and wholesaling the surplus. And then in uh, 2014, I think it was, I, I had paired uh, pure, uh, what we thought at the time, what we then knew at the time, were Costa Rican tea positives together. And I produced the first litter of Costa Rican tea positives. The funny thing was that I was, away it seems that every year i go on vacation at the exact time whenever my coolest litters should be dropping so i uh i think i was in north carolina at the time and i had a friend a, a grad student in my department that was house sitting for me he was also into reptiles and I, I told him which cages to check and i was away for two weeks and he, he called me up to say that the female had given birth to six babies and he took a picture and they looked nothing like the female they looked mm. kind of un unimpressive so I got home and I was looking at them and I was like, well, they're kind of okay. Uh, but I'd also bred that male to a leopard at the time and to a couple of other things and produced litters as well that year. It took about, you know, maybe two or three sheds to start really seeing what these things were and how different they were and how variable they were. And they're a trait that over the first two or three years of their lives, they will change dramatically. Right. So you know how ball pythons, once they get to 600 grams, they start looking really shitty? Yep. With these animals, they start getting better and better and better. Correct, yeah. Um, so it, it almost makes me want to hold on to them a lot longer before I would sell them. Uh, 
so once I started seeing how cool these were, it really supported me having done those early breedings. So breeding it to leopard, making double head leopard Costa Rican teas, breeding it to, um, you know, the variety of different things that I'd done. Um, and it's meant in the last couple of years, I've started to be able to cross them back and produce some really amazing, amazing animals from it. And they're an animal that I can, you know, I very rarely let people see my collection of animals. But um, it's kind of odd, my, you know, my friend back in Northern Ireland, Jonathan Harvey, that I mentioned earlier, um, after living in Belfast, he then moved over to England. And then I moved to the U.S. And then it turned out he moved to Houston. Oh wow! And then and then he moved to Knoxville. And, uh, and just recently, um, he came over to my house. He was staying. He was traveling, and he he stayed at my place. So it's kind of fun to reconnect. And I was showing him the animals, and he saw the Costa Rican tea positives, and he was just blown away by them. The variability in that line is remarkable. They can go from being deep purple uh, to being kind of cream and pink. Mm-hmm. Um, they can change in color from night to day. Uh, but then whenever I, so it meant whenever I crossed it into the leopard and I had the leopard um, uh, orange tail hypo Costa Rican tea, that animal is pink in places, it's purple in places, it's orange. It's mind-blowing and it's heavily speckled. And that was another really funny one because I was on vacation for three weeks and we had a house sitter looking after our dogs and I came back knowing that I had a couple of litters that were due and I opened up the tub and there was this little pink and orange snake sitting looking at me. It already shed its skin. And I fed it that night, and there was a it was a male, and uh, it's just remarkable. So I've that lineage I've just been really happy with. I, I I still think you know in three years time, whenever I breed the the hypo Costa Rican tea leopard to the Central American motley Costa Rican tea, it's going to be producing some amazing things. And whenever I breed it to Inca Costa Rican tea, it's going to produce amazing things. And I'm truly excited about seeing what the black-eyed anorthoristic Costa Rican tea looks like after seeing, you know, the VPI snow, because I would consider it quite similar in many ways to the VPI tea positive uh, in no, terms of some of, the, some of the colors, yeah, uh, just in a smaller form. Uh, so I think it's going to do really cool things with the uh, anorthoristic lines. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, and there's a few guys here in Arizona that are working with uh, with the Costa Rican tea plus. I know Dave Dornsey is one he of does. those He does. He got them for me, yeah. Dave's yeah. a really good friend of mine. We, yeah. uh, Dave and I speak... Um, probably multiple times a day yeah it's one of my best friends so uh, he got animals for me and has continued to get animals for me and he produced he produced the world's one and only uh, leopard costa rican tea uh a couple of months after i produced the hypo form and his was a male also so he got them from double hats and chris gilbert got a pair of the double hats from me yep. and um uh who else got them uh, rich del bono got some of the tea positives from me um Ken that produces Sterling Boas, he got some double hats from me. Uh, so there's some of the people that you know they're bigger hitters that have definitely got them. But Dave's done really well with them, and he's got a he's got a, a sleeper group of animals uh, that people are going to be amazed with in a couple of years' time whenever he starts really producing from them. You know, he got one of the uh, the motley Costa Rican teas that I produced. The I produced two males, and he got one of them. Oh wow! Uh, so he's going to produce some cool stuff, you know. So yeah, absolutely, man. So yeah. let me ask you. With all the potential that this gene has, do you feel like it's poised to be one of the key genes in the hobby uh, in the future? I think whenever people start uh, crossing it into other things, I think whenever we see the Costa Rican tea blood, I think whenever we see the Costa Rican tea Inca, the Costa Rican tea Aztec, the the labyrinth Costa Rican tea, I think it's going to be pretty cool because it's a really neat trait. It's not a standard caramel albino it's night and day different than the Nicaraguan uh, standard kind of stone broke line tea positive. Um, I, I think people are going to be very excited by it, uh, and whenever they see it in the flesh, you know, I don't, I don't do very well advertising it. I take terrible pictures. I rarely take pictures. I, I don't vend shows. I, uh, you know, I've got an Instagram page and a Facebook page that I update sometimes, you know, and I'm probably not the best person to be managing a project like that. <laughs> uh, but as I said, it's a hobby for me, you know, but I, I see a huge amount of interest in it. And a lot of people contact me and I've got a waiting list for for female Costa Rican teas, um, you know, the length of my arm. Um, we seem, seem to see a, a bias in males in the litters that we produce so far. Um, but a lot of people, what's funny is a lot of people will get an animal from me and then they'll come back and they'll be like, all right, all right oh, I want double heads, you know, what can I get? And I'll tell them, and, and they really start jumping in head first, you know. So the, it's funny, I've got one pair left of the Costa Rican tea leopards. 
and as I say, there's only eight or nine or ten pairs of those in the world that I've produced from two litters, and they produce really cool animals. Um, same thing with the black eyed anthristic Costa Rican tea double hats. There's only 2.6 in the world, and I've got a pair or a trio for sale, or will sell maybe, or trade. Um, and people would be right on the ground project with those right on the ground floor. Um, so I think once they start getting, I think once we get past this first uh, maybe year or two of these double hats and triple hat crosses where people are seeing the real potential from them, I think they're going to take off. No, absolutely. Um, so the people that have got from me, I think are going to be in really good positions. You know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm actually uh, going to be hitting up uh, Dave about some uh, relatively soon that we've been chatting oh, cool. about. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool, man. So let's go ahead and uh, take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to do the Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen. All right, guys, it's time for the Dirty Dozen. So I am going to ask you 12 questions. You give me 12 answers. They can be as short or as long as they need to be, as long as uh, you're answering the question. So number one, what is the current size of your collection? Um, all in uh, Boa Imperator and Boa Sigma make up about 100. And then the Corallus, the Carpet Pythons, and the Blood Pythons are about another 40. So about 140 in total. Fantastic. Number two. Uh, Husbandry-related questions. Are you a frozen and thawed guy or are you a live guy? And what's your betting choice? Uh, I, throughout my life, I've always used frozen thaw, uh, except for recently, this past year, whenever, uh, just due to work, um, I would buy live to start babies off, maybe for one or two feeds, but then they would change the defrost very quickly. Um, betting, I, uh, and, and with defrost, I always buy from Cold-Blooded Cafe. I think they do a really good quality rodent. Um, with uh, betting, I always use, well, I do two things, well, maybe three things. I um, use the packing paper that you can get in Lowe's um, because it fits okay. perfectly yeah, yeah, into yeah. a CB70 and just put two sheets and fold it over. Uh, and it also fits perfectly into a, uh, into a, a FB90. So I use those on all of my animals. Um, in the, uh, I use Vision baby racks the v15s and v18s and i use bounty select a sheet because they're perfect and easy yeah to they do. are <laughs> yep. yeah Same here. Um, yeah um and then for my adult boas whenever they're gravid i used to use either coconut fiber or aspen um but there was just problems with that you know for i, I just had issues with it um but um what i've done the last couple of years is you know we get that much junk mail that i shred it and i use shredded paper hmm. um and I put that into the cage, and it means the females can bed down into it. And it's I got bags and bags of the stuff that I accumulate throughout the year, so it's I've always got a, a plenty full supply of it. Huh, that is interesting. All right, number three, what's your favorite morpher locality? Ooh, you know that's split between two. It would be the Costa Rican T positive and the anarthristic Sonoran. Mm. So Sonoran bows in general, but for morphs, it would be the pure Sonoran anarthristic and the pure Costa Rican T positive. It's hard to split between the two. You know, I would. Having originated, the the anarthristic originated from my collection, and the Costa Rican tea really took off from my collection. It's really hard to uh, it's hard to, to choose one. You know? All right, number four. What is the most overrated morpho locality? Oh, you know, I hate this one. It's <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think everybody's different. Um, like I've had, I've had a lot of different animals, and well, what appeals the, the least to you? The one that I thought would appeal to me more that turned out to appealing to me very little turned out to be the sterling boa. Mm -hmm. And I hate that because actually I think it's a really cool animal. Uh, whenever you see it as a baby, I think they're really neat. And uh, early on I got a, a sterling female and a hypo head sterling male from Ken. And I loved them, but over you know the space of a year or two, I just started getting less and less interested in the sterling. And then I traded them. I actually traded them to Dave Dornseef. Oh wow! And then and I I got it's funny because I got two uh, FB the Freedom Breeder uh, seventy the thirty ones in each you know like the ten levels of of three or whatever yeah I got two of those um, which was nice um, and then about a year later uh, my friend Dave Palumbo hit me up and uh, asked if I was interested in trading uh, f uh, some double head uh, blood leopards for um, a hypo sterling male and i thought yeah why not i'll do that there uh, and then i had that for a while and i thought you know i'm again i'm just not impressed by it i, I didn't see what i could do with it 
you know, putting it into Central American bulls was not something I really wanted to do, and I didn't want to buy other Columbia morphs. So I, I think, sadly, I think that, um, and and it, I I don't want to take away from what Ken's done with it because I think they're really cool. And seeing the VPI Sterling, I think looks really neat. Uh, I just don't know where else you can go with it. So it's not. I don't think it's overrated. I think it's just there's less potential with it maybe that and maybe that I'm not seeing. Yep. All right, and I think this, I think the, I think the score is probably the most overrated. Sorry, I'll end up on that one there. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah. Just just due to the health issues, I think the score is overrated. Yeah. All right, number five. What's the most underrated more for locality? Ooh, that's another good one. Uh, I think I think Central Americans are obviously going to be the general. Um, I think the Sonoran hypomelanistic is probably one of the most underrated. Um, and these things can look amazing. They're very variable. Um, they can go from being nicer than a hog island boa to being kind of muddy. So I think getting good animals that have like bright orange eyes and, uh, you know, myself and Chris Gilbert and Vin Russo have produced some really exceptional animals over the years. And I think when people see those, they really stand back and are amazed by it. And then whenever you cross that into leopard, they just look fantastic. So I think I would say Sonoran hypomelanistics. Yeah, no, and I think what's going to be fantastic is when that Sonoran hypomelanistic gets mixed into the pied. Yeah, that's that 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 will be my. You know, I I hope to have pied. You know, I hope to and get into that project in, in the next five years sometime. You know, I think yeah. it's pretty cool. The fact that it's a pure Mexican, a pure Sigma, excites me, and I only want to get it as a pure Sigma. I don't want it crossed into Colombians, which will right. happen. You know. yeah. All right, man. What is your what what is your favorite part of the hobby? Uh, I think just meeting, well, the animals obviously are the, the reason I'm in it. But I think outside of that, I think it's just getting to hang out and chat to cool people. You know, as I say, like meeting people like Dave, uh, my buddy Nathan, uh, Dave and Tracy Barker, all of these people that, you know, I just get to hang out with at shows that I only might see at shows, for example. And I don't go to a lot of shows, but I just talk to online and stuff. I think it's really cool. You, you learn about their projects. You learn about, you know, what's working for them and not working for them. And then it expands further into just general, you know, what's everything, what's happening with, with life in general. Right. Uh, and I think that's kind of cool. It's a community that's really, I think, really need to be in. All right. Number seven, what's the worst part of the hobby? The community. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I, think there's, I, I think there's some aspects of it. Uh, people, uh, they overrate themselves. Uh, they think they're, you know, the be all and end all because they've got cool animals. There's people that, talk themselves up as being a big deal whenever they haven't bred animals and they just invested heavily in them. So it's spotting the bullshit from, from not. Um, Amen. So, and I think that's driven by social media, but I, you know, I, I said it before, social media is something I hate, but social media is something that, that we all require to an extent. And it's the way we promote our animals because forums are gone. And yeah. even on forums, you had people who were the same, you know, they could hide behind their names and, and make out as if they were just these big deals, you know. And uh, I think it's just whenever you meet them, you can spot that generally a mile away. Yeah. So I think being selective about who you just, who you talk with, who you sell to, who you hang out with, you know, I think that's it. Well, I'm not gonna lie, man. I miss those forum days. I'm the same. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed those, man. That I learned a lot during those days, and I definitely enjoyed. I'm not even gonna lie. I enjoyed some of the drama that went on there. <laughs> you know, yeah. just watching being a fly on the wall with, with some of the issues that different people had. And it probably, it probably took less time out of our day as well. The fact that we've got, oh, yeah. you know, iPhones that we can just flip onto Facebook or whatever. Uh, and it's constantly there. I think just the fact that before with a forum, you'd have to sit down over your lunch break or at night and immerse yourself in it for a little bit and then walk away from it. Now it's just always there. So I think it makes it more, much more, more drama than it needs to be. Yeah. Was there a particular forum that was your favorite? Um, I always loved the original King Snake ones and the yep. um, the Reptile Insider. I really yep. liked. Yeah, yeah, I liked the, the, the BLBC. That was a that was a nice one, and and the original King Snake forums. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think they I think they were fun. I, I liked the the searchability of them as well. The fact that you could go back and and find out things that people were doing ten years ago, and you can still do it. Like I do it frequently on. Oh yeah. On KingSnake.com, you search a species or a, or a breeder and pull up stuff from the early 2000s and stuff you know the pictures aren't there generally anymore because of photo bucket and stuff but you can still see the see the text that was written so i think that's kind of cool i like them and it would be cool to see them come back again yeah no um, i'm with you 
Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, number eight, what other species do you keep non-boa-wise and why? Um, so obviously the Corallus, the Rischenbergeri, the um, Caninus, the Northern Emeralds, and the Amazons. And I've, I've got some Granadensis coming um, uh, and Annulatus coming as well. Oh, wow. Um, I, yeah, I keep... Um, what else do I keep? I keep uh, two pairs of Darwin carpet pythons. Um, so a pair of them was given to me, a pair of wild type were given to me by Nick Mutton and Ryan Young because we're doing some work together on a project. And another pair of pure Darwin albinos were given to me by a friend, Ra- Ralph P- uh, Polanski, because um, he's getting some Costa Rican boas from me. And they're fun to have. And there's I got a history with Darwin carpets from 20 years ago back in Northern Ireland. So it was nice to actually get those again. Um, what else? Oh, the the Sumatran, the caramel Sumatran short tails that Tracy Barker gave me, uh, Brazilian rainbows that I've got, and then I've got the oh, I've got green Sanzinia, and then I've oh, wow. got um, I've got uh, the Western Hognos. Yep. Yeah. All right, man. Number nine. What's a common misconception about you? Probably that I'm unapproachable. Uh, I, I I think I think people think that because I got a PhD, I must be this old dusty guy that doesn't, you know, that you can't talk to. I'll tell you how, why this is, why I say this. Um, 10 years ago, I was at Daytona and I was, uh, you know, I was there with Jeff Ronnie and we were chatting uh, on the floor and a really good friend of mine, Dave Levison, uh, who I've known for, I don't know, 15 years, came up to me with his girlfriend at the time and, and he introduced me to her and she goes, oh, you're Warren Booth. I said, yeah, and she goes, well, I, th- I thought you would be older. Uh, what she said, I thought you'd be older, um, taller, and less foreign. And I was like, all oh, right, wow, that's great. You know, five foot seven from Belfast. And uh, at that point, I was like 30 years old or 32. That's funny. But then, so Jeff Ronnie always mocks me about that. The other one is that, that people think that, you know, I, when I rarely go on to any of these BOA groups or anything and comment anymore. I just kind of see what's happening and disappear. Um, I think the thing is that whenever I see something that I know is not right, I'll call it out as being not right. So I'll, if I see bullshit, I'll call bullshit. And I think that makes people think that that uh, I'm unapproachable. Um, no, it's just me saying this is not right and there's no point dancing around it. You know, there's there's no other way of saying that this is right. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but it's not right. Um, but then when people contact me, and I get contacted... Um, multiple times a week on private messenger and stuff we i ended up building up very strong relationships with people just helping them i'm never going to sell an animal to them sometimes i give animals to them um and it's just uh you know they see that i'm i just i'm just very intolerant of, of bs all right man number 10 what makes you say what was i thinking when you look back at your time in the hobby yellow belly ball pythons <laughs> i got tricked into a yellow belly ball python uh, maybe 18 years ago, 19 right. years ago, whenever they were, they were worth money. I was doing a deal with a, a guy, an importer that was bringing animals. I was getting animals in from Florida, and that ended up costing me like fifteen thousand dollars. Oh Jesus! And it was a female, and it, it, uh, it. I didn't want it, but he'd screwed up other stuff, and I had to take it. And uh, it, um, it never fed very well. It never bred. I ended up trading it, and I got a lot of stuff for it, but it was just a nightmare. And it was funny because then at, at an Arlington show like three years ago, I went and I bought a yellow belly ball python for 50 bucks just for the sake of doing it. And it fed great <laughs> and it did wonderful. Uh, but I, I think that, I think ball pythons in general, I think, you know, people know me for my Corallus tree boas and my boas, uh, my Imperator and my Sigma. So I think maybe stick with what I am known for and not what I want to be known for. You know? There you go, man. All right, number 11, what's one tip you could give the people looking to invest in boas and in reptiles in general? You know, I never recommend people to invest in it. Um, I think it's the wrong way to think about it because that instantly makes people think that there's going to be a cash return. I think if, you're gonna, if you've got money, whether it's 50 bucks or $50,000, get what you really like. Um, you've got to look at it every day and you've got to clean it. You know, you've, hear, you've heard all of these big snake breeders say that you know, what do they do really in life? They clean their snakes. You know, they're picking up snake crap every day. So if you're not going to be happy doing that, don't get the animal. So therefore, get what you're going to really enjoy looking at, what you're going to enjoy, whether you pick it up and do whatever you want with it. Uh, make sure it's something you like. 
and then once you've done that, just be selective about what you cross with it. So I, I hate to see people saying, right, I'm going to get into Costa Rican teas. What's the cheapest one you've got? Oh, boy. Instead of saying, I want to spend as much as I can to get the best animal I can. It, the money's not the issue for me. It's the, you know, if you're going to start a project, start it right. And there's a, there's a, um, a carpet python breeder in the UK called Paul Harris from UK Pythons. Yeah. And I was, I was staying with Paul, I don't know, maybe 22 or 23 years ago. I was over at his house. And uh, at that point, he had his, all of his carpets and his black-headed pythons and stuff like that. But he also had some, he was getting into ball pythons. And he had just spent a vast amount of money on three high white male pides. And I'd said, uh, no, I mean, a vast amount of money, you know, 20 something years ago. Uh, and I'd, I'd, I was like, Paul, why did you, why did you buy the, the highest whites you could get, knowing that that could breed to a head and produce low white pides? There's no guarantee you're going to produce anything like it. And he said, because on my website, this is going to be the best animal that people look at. Mm. And I said, all right. So it's, you know, you're thinking about your market and how you want to market the animal. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I see, same thing with ball pythons, same thing with anything. People will buy their animal and then they'll breed it to the cheapest animal they can find. I think you should be really selective. Buy the best that you can afford. And if you can't afford to get the best, wait a bit and then do a payment plan or whatever. But try and get that higher notched animal. And I think you'll be better off with it in the long run. All right. Final question, number 12, any shout-outs? Shout-outs, who would I like to say hi to? Um, people that I enjoy hanging out with, like Dave Dornseif, um, uh, my, my buddy Nathan Lessie, who's a local to me, we, we talk snakes all the time, drink beer and have fun. Uh, people that I, I enjoy hanging out with whenever I go to shows are people like Rich Del Bono, um, uh, Dave and Tracy Barker, Mac Robinette, who's mainly a ball python guy but has a lot of bows as well. Uh, Rich Eiley is a good friend. Um, I'm trying to think who else I'm missing. You know, there's there's probably an ample amount of people that I'm I'm missing because I I kind of know a, a decent amount of people like Jeff Ronnie and stuff. I know a decent amount of people in the hobby. Um, probably more people than I should. Thomas, I thought Thomas was going to be on tonight. I really I met Thomas, uh, uh, but maybe eight years ago or nine years ago at, at uh, Tinley, and uh, I enjoy chatting with Thomas. We don't chat that much, but I I always enjoy chatting to him and Chase Baker and stuff. So. I think there's too many people to, to shout out, but, you know, the, the people that, that know that I know them know that I respect them. So, Awesome, man. Well, guys, that wraps it up for today. Warren, tell the people out there where they can see your animals and learn more about you. Uh, there's two places. One is on Facebook, um, so not my personal Facebook. I get a lot of requests for friends on my personal Facebook, and the, the, the thing that I post on my personal Facebook is pictures of my kids. Um, so you're probably not going to enjoy that, even though my kids are awesome. Um, if it's a Facebook page which is Boa Booth, just B O A B O O T H, um, you can find that. And also on Instagram, there's Boa Booth as well. So I, on Instagram, I try and update pictures maybe every two days. It might not be the best quality, um, but you'll get to see what's there. And anytime I've got a new litter or a new pairing, I tend to put it on Facebook and Instagram. Awesome. And then you guys can find me at Morphs underscore Unleashed in Instagram. All right, guys, thanks for listening. We are out. Guys, that was an awesome episode. Thanks to Dr. Warren Booth of Boa Booth for joining us today. Join us next time as we speak with Dan Boudet of Celestial Exotics. We're going to talk about his work with the Ferrari Pastel line, along with tips on how to select the right projects to move your collection forward. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Do us a favor. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and YouTube. Until next time, grow them slow.